Welcome to this most detailed breakdown. Today we'll be analyzing Mjolnir Air Assault Variant, which has been implemented into various Mjolnir platforms. As this is a variant breakdown, a lot of the base systems are identical to various Mjolnir permutations. For full information on the individual generations and permutations of Mjolnir, see the relevant breakdown on our main channel, but for now, we'll just look at the Air Assault Armor components and their functions, as we give them the most detailed treatment. The Air Assault, or AA variant, first entered service in 2535 as a permutation of the original Mark IV platform of Mjolnir. Originally designed by Uswire Armory, this variant was developed for the UNSC Army's Airborne Division with a focus on increasing operational effectiveness during high altitude and suborbital engagements. The main components of the AA armor set are the helmet, shoulders, torso and knees for the Gen 1 Mjolnir systems, and a dedicated Air Assault permutation for the Gen 2 Mjolnir systems. First we will start with the Gen 1. The helmet is designed to be aerodynamic, reducing drag during freefall, and its smooth appearance is purposefully intended to minimize down on possible snag points, which could lead to the paracords becoming tangled. While most Mjolnir helmets are made of titanium, the AA helmet is in fact made of a titanium polymer composite, reducing weight but maintaining structural integrity and protection level. The helmet contains all of the functional components that are standard across the entire Mjolnir range, but with the added features in internal systems allowing real-time virtualization of satellite imagery, three-dimensional GPS visualization and course plotting software, with enhanced altimeter, accelerometer and compass functionality, and direct topographical overlay systems, with enhanced specialized optics for use during all times of day or night. These systems allow enhanced spatial awareness while at altitude. The real-time visualization of satellite imagery allowed the wearer to see enhanced visual displays of areas far outside the range of normal vision. The user could choose to focus in using the real-time feeds to levels of detail equivalent to having a telescope attached to the front of the visor, as well as the ability to change the focus point at will and minimize down the display to a helpful minimap-like guide. The 3D GPS visualization and course plotting software enabled enhanced understanding of the wearer's location in relation to other members of their unit, objectives, targets and environmental factors, and gave the wearer the opportunity to plot their freefall or movement course in a 3D spatial render, very similar in sophistication to fighter pilots heads up display systems. The altimeter, accelerometer and compass are all enhanced versions with much finer tracking resolutions than even the base Mjolnir is capable of. The direct topographical overlay systems with enhanced specialized optics granted the user the ability to see the exact contoured shapes of the landscape below them and any constructs that may be nearby even in complete cloud cover or at night. It overlays known topographics via the HUD system onto the wearer's field of view and the enhanced optics cancels out obstructions to clear line of sight by employing a full spectrum optic system that uses the constructive and destructive interference from the whole light spectrum to filter out atmospheric conditions that may affect clarity of vision at all times of day and night. The helmet can also be up-armoured with additional armour plating designed to increase the protection factor, particularly over the forehead of the helmet, and an attached command network module. This upgrade, known as the UACNM, not only offers increased protection but is also favoured in use by squad leaders within the airborne attachment. The command network module allows the squad leaders to more effectively coordinate their contingent of troops by allowing them to upload orders, directions, waypoints, targets and objectives to the HUD systems of their subordinates, granting the leader the ability to orchestrate their troops like extensions to their own body. The next upgrade variant is called the FCI, which features an improved version of the command network module with an external hardened uplink. This improved function is favoured by more senior commanding officers as it allows the coordination of squad leaders and their individual squad members simultaneously, and the hardened uplink enables the signal range to be enhanced over a much larger area, allowing the coordination of squads over larger topographical areas. It is also favoured by Pathfinder units, which are special units within the Airborne Division. Their main function is to be deployed in advance to the rest of their comrades in order to mark drop zones, increasing the precision and efficiency of airborne deployments. The enhanced command network module with hardened uplink complements this role, as generally speaking, these units are on the ground far ahead of the rest of their division and thus need the added range and sophistication of communication in order to coordinate their incoming brethren. The shoulders and knees of the AA variant, known as the FJ Para, are specially designed plates that offer maximum protection for minimum weight. 
Again, these components are made of a titanium polymer composite and are thus much lighter than the titanium alloy used in the rest of Mjolnir, but offer equal protection. They are again designed to be aerodynamic and smooth in design to minimise on snag points that could lead to entanglement in the unit's power cords. The torso also sees additional up armouring for the AA variant in two forms. The HP Halo or Hard Point High Altitude Low Opening Supplemental Chest Armour and the HP Parafoil Supplemental Chest Armour. The HP Halo Armour offers two large titanium plates over the chest that lock to hard points on the main armour system and extend these hard points for connection to high altitude low opening gear, also known as Halo gear. The Halo technique is a method of aerial insertion developed by the United States Air Force in the 20th century as a means of deploying troops from aircraft above the range of surface-to-air missiles, allowing the troops to freefall until 800 feet above the ground when they would deploy their parachutes. This high freefall speed, minimum forward airspeed and low altitude of opening meant that the troops could insert into enemy territory in a stealth-like fashion, minimising on the amount of time the troops were hanging under their chutes and visible to ground observers. The Army Airborne Division of the UNSC still employed this time-tested insertion technique in the 26th century as it has useful applications during their operations in defence of skyhooks and space elevators during planetary assaults from adversaries. Below the two supplemental armour plates on the chest are two vents that are aerodynamically designed to create a downward force similar to an aerofoil shape of a wing, but in reverse. Rather than generating an upward lifting force, it generates a downward pushing force. These two vents are proportionally very small against the overall size of the armour, and for good reason. Their small size means they only generate a small amount of downward force. This is critical to ensure that the Spartan's freefall speed and manoeuvrability is not adversely affected by the force they generate, but is sufficient enough to maintain a good, controllable body orientation during freefall. They also help during a parafoil opening by briefly creating a highly focused and linear jet stream of air during the sudden deceleration that assists in fully opening the parafoil in a quick and controlled manner. The chest also features additional holsters for grenades and a waste grenade belt. The HP Powerful features two heavy-duty straps over the chest of the base armour system and has locking hardpoints nearer the shoulders for compatibility with the G25 PAS airfoil carapace. This system is a deployment package for a Powerful but also enables a Spartan wearing earlier versions of Mjolnir powered assault armour platforms to enter the atmosphere of a planet from high orbit, a feat usually only possible with an ODST's characteristic SOEV orbital drop pod. Carapace is a specially designed carbon titanium composite material designed to protect the carapace's internal components and the wearer from the intolerable heat of re entry. Mjolnir is capable of withstanding re entry, but for earlier versions it was considered outside of its operational capacity, thus necessitating the need for such a device. The Spartan would turn their back to the planet and begin insertion, being somewhat protected from the direct heat of re entry, instead, just dealing with the ambient heat of re entry which Mjolnir and its sophisticated internal systems were more than capable of handling. Once the Spartan had completed the orbital insertion and the heat of re-entry had dissipated, the Spartan could roll and deploy the aerofoil. The carapace also features connection hardpoints for weapons, so they're not lost during the chaos of re-entry. The aerosol variant for the Gen 1 Mjolnir platforms was tested at the Shiofok firing range, and has since been battle-tested in many aerial and low orbital operations the most notable of which being during the fall of Reach in the summer of 2552 and during the Battle of Earth in October of the same year. Uswaya Armoury was stationed on Reach when it fell, and subsequent developments of this system and its adaptation into the Gen 2 Mjolnir platforms was handled by Naftali Contractor Corporation. The Aerosalt variant is still fully compatible with the Gen 2 platforms but has somewhat been supplanted by the Gen 2 dedicated Aerosalt variant, which we will now look at in detail. The Gen 2 variant was developed by Naftali Contractor Corporation, specifically designed for Mjolnir Gen 2 platforms used by the Spartan 4s. While the previous iterations of Mjolnir powered assault armour was often created and manufactured by organisations, departments and branches of the United Nations Space Command, the unified Earth government contracted numerous corporations to design the Gen 2 armour variants. In addition to these larger corporations, a major policy shift within the UEG has led smaller corporations and businesses being given the opportunity to compete in the paramilitary, military and security markets. Many smaller industrial design firms and military subcontractors have used the common Gen 2 Mjolnir software and exoskeleton as a springboard for their own innovations. 
Due to this, again, we will only be assessing the aerosol components, as the entirety of the rest of the Gen 2 platform is exactly the same and will be covered in its own most detailed breakdown. The helmet of the Gen 2 AA features long-range integrated communications network systems as their primary innovation, making it favoured by fireteam leaders, allowing them the ability to remain in communication with their team over much larger geographical areas. The Gen 2 also takes a lot of inspiration from the original Gen 1 AA in regards to its aesthetics, changing very little from its Gen 1 predecessor, maintaining a similarly smooth and aerodynamic shape, as well as a similar HUD system, also featuring real-time satellite imagery, 3D GPS visualization, enhanced altimeter, accelerometer and compass functionality, and topographical overlay systems with enhanced specialized optics. As with the entirety of the Gen 2 system, the helmet includes all of the expected functional components that are standard across the entire Mjolnir range. The armor plating has been completely reworked to be lighter but still offer the same protective properties, being made of a multi-laminate titanium polymer nanocomposite material. The primary difference being in that the Gen 2 tech suit has the primary Gen 2 BIOS and firmware built into it, allowing the software packages from the AA variant to be copied to the internal BIOS and stored as a HUD preset profile, enabling the Spartan to activate it either partially or in its entirety if the situation calls for it even if they choose to outfit themselves with a different variant. The shoulder pauldrons are still very similar in design to the Gen 1, but with an enhanced aerodynamic profile, minimizing on drag still further and ensuring that there are no snag points. They are specifically hollow plates, composed of equally thick inner and outer plates with a spacer void between them. Again, they are composed of a multi-laminate titanium composite material, offering lowered weight but matched ballistic protection, with their own integrated shield emitters and crystalline refractive coating to disperse the heat from directed energy weapons, as one would expect from any Mjolnir component meeting the strictures for groundside combat as laid out by the Damascus Ordnance Commission. The chest and back of the aerosol variant of Mjolnir Gen 2 is again made of a lighter weight titanium composite material and features smooth casing design to the power units on the back, built-in shield emitters, crystalline refractive coating, sensor array and triply redundant repair and bypass nodes, biofoam injectors and magnetic weapon holder strips, as well as a collar bracer that serves two functions. One is to channel airflow to increase laminar boundary layer flow and reduce turbulent boundary layer flow at the apex of the sternum. It does this by enabling airflow behind the chest piece. This in turn prevents swirls and eddies to form in the area between the chin and the clavicle, thereby maintaining a laminar boundary layer and forcing the turbulent boundary layer further towards the feet during the terminal velocity freefall or thrust assisted descent. The plating shape is designed to be aerodynamic and lack any snag points which could cause entanglement in parafoils. This design decision is somewhat aesthetic in regards to entanglement in that all Gen 2 platforms feature the M805X forward acceleration system fulcrum mitigating thruster pack. This pack, while not a total replacement for external thrust apparatus, is still powerful enough to reduce a Spartan's full velocity to a sufficiently tolerable level to land from any altitude, given the Gen 2's significantly lighter weight and stronger muscle power assist ratio. This thruster pack was originally designed by Lethbridge Industrial, who between 2557 and 58 developed the Anubis class Mjolnir Gen 2 suit with an integrated thruster pack that was developed as a technological successor to their own M805X thruster. Unfortunately for the Anubis class, the original thruster was integrated as standard into all Gen 2 arm systems, making the Anubis thruster somewhat redundant. That concludes our breakdown of the aerosol variant of Mjolnir. It is highly recognisable and uniquely tailored armour system, and has been considered for applications of unaugmented personnel within the Delta 6 division. It is worth noting that based on requests from veteran Spartan 2 and Spartan 3 operatives, the UNSC Ordnance Commission reassessed a refined and upgraded suit of Mark V air assault variant, leading to the creation of the Intruder variant, which is more specifically a recreation of the custom armour set worn by CAT V320, Spartan 3, and member of Noble Team, who gave their lives in the protection of Reach. It was later commissioned by the Spartan branch as part of a research initiative seeking to leverage synergistic outcomes between specialised Mjolnir suits. The results of this research are still being processed at this time.
The Gen 2 aerosol variant is an excellent example of refining technological innovations for applications of highly specific implementation. It serves a very significant role in the Spartan operations and has led to great successes in power armor design and evolution. And it's all but certain this is not the last we'll hear of it. Thanks for sticking with me. If you have any suggestions on anything within the Halo universe that you would like to see given the most detailed treatment, stick them in the comments down below and I'll get to them as soon as I can. As I'm sure you understand, the level of detail that I insist on getting down to is of an intensity that it can take quite a while to fully flesh out the more complicated constructs. That being said, it's something I really enjoy and I hope you have too. Remember, if you want to learn more about the baseline Neonid platforms that these variants are compatible with, pop over to our channel and give them a watch. While you're there, subscribe and hit the little bell icon, that way when we put out our next breakdown you'll be notified the second it hits the shelves. Also, if you want to see this kind of thing continue and can afford it, perhaps consider supporting us on Patreon. It would be a massive help in keeping this going and speeding up the frequency of these videos. If you can, I'd be more grateful than I have words to explain and it would really help uh, sort of fleshing out an idea I've got in the pipeline for some Halo themed merchandise that I might be getting into your hands. But for now, take care guys and go rest your brain.